there. I assume that we have a, a pretty good turnout. I was watching the Twitter feed. It seems like we do. Um, happy that I could present this research. Uh, first, I'd like to just co uh, mention my uh, co-authors, Hadi Asghari at uh, TU Delft and Milton Mueller at Syracuse University. Uh, who helped uh, in this research project. Um, I just recently presented this at uh, TPRC, uh, which is uh, in the United States. They also hold one in Europe. And um, you know, one of the ideas of that conference is that policymakers need to hear when research shows that policies may be ambiguous. And I think uh, this is a case of that. And I also think um, just that approach is probably a good approach for GigaNet research um, in the, to follow as well. Um, this is preliminary research. It adds an incremental step to a 2012 uh, paper that we presented at GigaNet that provided an initial look at the secondary market for IP addresses. Uh, that paper has been recently published in Info. Um, so what I'm, where I'm going to go with this is uh, first I'm going to set the stage uh, why this issue is of an interest and what exactly the policy issue is. Then I'm just going to touch briefly on the method and share some of the data that we've collected. And then offer some observations and some policy recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. I assume we're moving. There we go. OK. There's a bit of a lag here. So the prior study that uh, we did showed a thriving uh, secondary market for IPv4 addresses. And uh, these are addresses that are transferred between parties. They're not an allocated initially or assigned initially by the regional internet registries. And up in front of you, you see the, uh, the governance of the uh, secondary market. It's governed by the RIRs. Uh, the transfer, it's largely governed by the RIR's policies, and these policies are enforced by the RIR Registry Service Agreement, the RSA, or a variation of the legacy regional service agreement, which preserves certain rights uh, for the use of the address holder. Now, I say sort of here because allegedly there are unrecorded transfers where current address holders uh, maintain de jure control of the addresses, but they end up leasing them to another party. Um, there are also allegedly transfers of legacy address resources occurring that don't involve any contractual arrangement with the RIRs. And this activity is completely outside of the RIR governance regime, and it's governed almost exclusively by the market. Um, this apparent diversity and kind of movement towards market-oriented governance of the address secondary market really shouldn't be surprising. Um, we've seen similar developments in governance of other resources, um, most notably uh, reform of secondary markets for spectrum, uh, starting in the early mid-2000s in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, the takeaway from that is that regulators kind of recognize that when faced with scarcity, the liberalizing the policies that governed the exchange of these resources could make the re make them more readily available uh, and users and promote innovation. So one conclusion of our previous study was that some of the RIR policies, specifically needs assessment, this is a, a particular policy, introduced significant friction into the IPv4 secondary market. And it may have been inconsistent with organizations' demands and uh, planning time horizons. So therefore, we wanted to know a little bit more about needs assessment. And we posed the research question, and are numbers sold in the secondary market that do go through needs assessment immediately put to use as the needs assessment policy is intended to enforce? So next slide, please. So what is needs assessment? Well, the RIRs have required technical assessments of operational need before they would grant anyone the right to use a block of IP numbers. 
There are various requirements that are applied uh, according to the type of activity, whether it's allocation or assignment of resources by the registry, uh, reassignment of the resources by a member organization, or transfer of these resources. And practi practically, it means that members must demonstrate efficient utilization of resources that are previously allocated or assigned. And they must provide detailed plans for use for any requested resource. Uh, similarly, the RIRs require members to follow needs assessment policies when they actually uh, reassign those resources to their customers. And in fact, they, some, uh, one of them reserves the right uh, to review and approve those decisions. The uh, European registry, RIPE NCC, uh, specifically justifies its needs-based needs policies as necessary to avoid stockpiling of resources. Another often heard argument for needs assessment is based on the desire to conserve uh, IPv4 address resources. However, uh, the needs assessment policy is being challenged. There's currently a policy proposal in the RIPE region, uh, RIPE 2013-03, that's being considered. It's entitled No Need Post-Depletion Reality Adjustment and Cleanup which would eliminate needs assessment as an eligibility criterion for acquiring IPv4 number blocks in the transfer market. Uh, among other changes, it removes conservation as the stated goal of the policy. Now, the logic behind the proposal is that operational need as a criterion for assignments and allocations only makes sense when there is a pool of free, as in unpriced, uh, unallocated addresses. Now, the registry uh, is uh, currently in their last slash eight. The, re the European registry is in their last slash eight. Uh, the Asia Pacific region is uh, post exhaustion. They have no more addresses to allocate. And Aaron still has uh, 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 addresses to allocate. Anyway, once that basic fact uh, no longer holds, uh, needs assessment by a registry really serves no necessary function, but it does add uh, additional bureaucracy and uncertainty, cost, and potential for arbitrariness to the process of reallocating addresses among competing uses and users. So what would be the end result of past? It would liberalize the allocation and the use of IPv4 number blocks. It would arguably open the door to a much more efficient and predictable market for numbers. Indeed, if it was passed, uh, it would be recognition that the concept of need is really contingent upon a variety of factors, price, time horizon, expected value, uh, potential substitutes, and a number of other uh, economic factors. Next slide, please. So, Supplementing our 2012 study, we collected data on each of the address blocks transferred in the market up to the first quarter of 2013, as reported by the RIRs. This data set now includes uh, transfers within the European region, which the RIPE NCC registry began reporting this year. Up until the end of the first quarter of 2013, uh, there have been over 200 transactions. Uh, involving 415 distinct address blocks traded, uh, totaling about 10.6 million unique IP addresses. The AP NIC region has recorded the largest amount of transactions uh, and addresses, address blocks transferred, but this activity actually constitutes the smallest amount of addresses. The Aaron region actually accounts for the uh, greatest number of addresses transferred. To get at the research question that we had in mind, for each block transferred, we looked up on a semi-annual basis from 2008 to 2013 uh, the routing information associated with the address block. That is the public advertisement of the autonomous system number. These are numbers uh, associated with network operators routing the block as represented in route views, which is a publicly available data source. Uh, the blocks were then coded whether or not the routing information had been updated over the time period evaluated and whether or not the block was routed or unrouted currently uh, and what party was routing the block. Now, assuming the transfer between unrelated organizations, 
uh, we would expect to see the routing information updated to a new autonomous system number or at a minimum unrouted status. Furthermore, if the point of address governance is to move scarce resources Anyone in the house still with recording me? in progress? Oh, there we go. Back up. Okay, can everyone hear me? exceptions, uh, our particular vantage point of the routing data might um, not reflect um, what's actually being routed. It doesn't necessarily prove that the addresses aren't in use. Okay, so uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Derek, can you tell me? I can't see the slide, so I assume that you're on the next one. Okay, well, great, thank you. Uh, so a key distinction among transferred blocks is that not all of them have had uh, have updated routing information associated with them. Of the 415 blocks, uh, about 84%, 348 of them, uh, had uh, routing information updated. And about 86% of those, uh, 298, uh, are being publicly routed. Of the uh, ones being routed, 80% uh, are being routed by the organization that acquired, uh, that was acquired the transfer block, about 15% by a third party, and somewhat strangely, the remaining are still routed by the organization that actually transferred the block. Uh, 50, blo uh, 50 blocks, or about 14%, comprising about 1.3 million addresses, were transferred and remain unrouted. And the acquiring organizations with the largest amounts of unrouted addresses includes Vodafone Americas, Microsoft, and Amazon. Um, the amounts, uh, Vodafone had about 332,000 addresses, Microsoft about 254,000 addresses, and Amazon about 131,000 addresses. But these amounts represent 30%, 62%, and 4% respectively of the total number of addresses that were transferred to these organizations. Uh, next slide, please. Now, 67 blocks, or 16% of all the blocks transferred didn't have any updated routing information. Uh, 29 of those are unrouted, while 38 of them are still being routed. Uh, nine blocks uh, of the 38, nine blocks were being routed by the organization that acquired uh, the transferred block, seven by a third party, and 22 remain routed uh, by the organization that transferred the block. Of those uh, blocks, uh, 18 of them, or for about 50% of the the non-updated but routed blocks were associated with transfers that occurred in the AP NIC, uh, the Asia Pacific region, and about 
35 or 34 percent in the ripe region and about uh, 18 percent in the uh, arid region. Next slide, please. All right, we should be on table five. Okay, so this is the kind of main point of uh, this research. Um, you know, as you can see from here, the majority of blocks, so 164 or about 60 percent of them, were routed within six months of the transfer date. Um, 65 more blocks were routed within one year, and 40 blocks were routed within 18 months or longer after the recorded transfer date. If you look at the Flash 16s, which are fairly, uh, from my understanding, are one of the most popular uh, blocks being traded, um, or in demand, rather, 32% um, of the Flash 16s and 22% of the slash 17s took 18 months or longer to be routed. Otherwise, all of the larger sized blocks were transferred uh, and routed within 18 months. Now, one noticeable pattern you can see here is that some of the smaller blocks, uh, like for instance the slash 20s through the slash 24s, are not routed until 18 months or longer after the transfer. For the slash 21s, 19% of the last 20 of the 21 blocks transferred were not routed until 18 months or longer, while 24% of the slash 23s and 18% of the slash 24 blocks took longer than 18 months to route. The uh, vast majority of the blocks routed 18 months or longer after the recorded transfer date were associated with transfers that occurred in the Aaron region. Uh, 93 percent of them, 37 out of 40. 7% were associated with transfers in the AP NIC region, and none were associated with the RIFE region. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to offer a few observations about what, we, what we've seen. Um, so, you know, our preliminary look at the relationship between transfers and the use of address blocks has uh, turned out to be much more complicated uh, than expected. But uh, we do think it allows us to make a couple of observations regarding the secondary market, and as well as make some recommendations for policy in this area. One example of the complexity of the transfer market are the blocks where routing information never changed before or after the transfer date. So the organization named as being in control of the block may have changed as a result of completing the, the, the policy process, of completing the transfer according to the RIR policies. But the de facto use of the block didn't actually change. This uh, calls into question whether these are actually market transfers at all. And we did note in our study, our 2012 study, that APNIC transfer data uh, doesn't distinguish between market transfers and internal transfers. If some of these transfers aren't true market transfers, then the number of transactions is somewhat less uh, than previously reported, particularly in that region. Now, you can ask, does this really matter? Uh, well, um, one would think that the buyers and sellers uh, in this market would want an accurate picture of what's actually transpiring. One policy change to consider would be for the AP NIC region to clearly separate the market transfers from internal transfers in its reporting. A more meaningful reform would require transacting parties to record publicly the price of the sale uh, so that we know that it's actually an arm's length tra transaction. This would be um, you know, consistent with suggestions that availability of more detailed price information is a requirement for a smoothly functioning market. This is something that we've seen in the spectrum market too. Unfortunately, those involved in transfers would likely be against sharing this kind of information. But, you know, even a general indication of whether or not the transfer was for uh, remuneration would be very helpful. Now, most blocks with updated routing information appear to be routed within 12 months of the transfer date. 
um, according to policies in the R of the RIRs. Now, some might simply claim that this proves that the policy of needs assessment is working, but we don't have any idea of how quickly they would or would not be used without needs assessment. So even with the needs assessment requirement, there is great variation in the time periods um, between transfer dates and when the blocks were routed. Eight blocks weren't routed, uh, were not routed after 24 months, exceeding the time span for assessing need. And there doesn't appear to be, at least in the data we've seen, uh, any predictable relationship between time and to route and block sizes, although most of the blocks not routed after 18 months were smaller ones. The, um, the length of time before smaller blocks were routed suggests that RIPES, the right proposal that's on the table to eliminate needs assessment would make less of a difference than one might think. Quite a few of these transfers of these smaller blocks already seem to not be, uh, seem to be not immediately needed. Now, there are some exceptional cases in which larger buyers did not quickly utilize the blocks that they acquired. You know, for example, Microsoft started to route most of its acquired blocks in the first half of 2013, more than a year and a half after the transfer date and our initial publication of that discrepancy. And the majority of the addresses that they have acquired through the transfer process remain unrouted. But it's impossible to know for sure how exactly needs assessment was applied in that transaction. So the relationship between needs assessment and actual usage really remains uh, uh, remains unclear, and whether it actually prevents stockpiling also remains unclear. So uh, in thinking about this, another policy approach, less radical than eliminating needs assessment altogether, could uh, require buyers of number blocks to simply route acquired addresses within a, a specified time frame. You know, this kind of uh, usage requirement would be a lot less murky and time-consuming than needs assessment. Uh, but it would probably mitigate any kind of anti-competitive stockpiling behavior just as effectively. And as we know uh, from uh, uh, similar usage requirement policies have been used, uh, implemented in other resource regimes, uh, for instance, the secondary market for radio spectrum. So I think at this point I've droned on long enough, and I'll uh, open up the floor for questions and comments. So do we have questions on the floor? Uh, Sala Tamanika Mora for the transcript. Uh, just very quickly, the question I wanted to ask was um, very interesting presentation in terms of uh, uh, your comments in terms of market dynamics and, and the variance and that sort of thing. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, I know you've done this study and I know you're reporting on it. What is the gist of, uh, what's the fundamental objective of the study? Is it, um, is it sort of a defense mechanism in terms of uh, delaying the arguments for transitioning to IPv6? Or what are you saying essentially in terms of... Uh, We wanted to specifically see if a, a particular policy, needs assessment, was actually doing what it's intended to do. And, um, you know, it's a very narrow study. Um, and it only looks at part of the transfer market. Um, but it's important, I think, uh, because, you know, it, it, it's focused on an actual policy at the RIRs that can be changed uh, and, in fact, uh, uh, looks like it will be changed. Um, and it will actually inter introduce uh, an interesting dynamic because um, it could impact inter-RIR transfers of addresses um, because there'll be different policies uh, in, two, in different regions. Um, 
So, uh, so that was, uh, you know, this, the, the basic point of the study. Um, does it inform, I, I do think it informs, uh, you know, broader issues like the transition to IPv6. It helps us understand, uh, you know, uh, how exactly um, this kind of long-term transition is going to occur and, and where we may need to tweak policies in order to allow that transition to um, uh, uh, proceed smoothly, you know, give us a smooth landing. Is that helpful? <laughs> you, have, you have to you have to give me a break. It is twenty to three in the morning here. So. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, is this Joanna? Let's see. Okay, so um, there was no modeling in this. This was simply a data collection exercise. We uh, wrote up a, a script that went out and uh, um, evaluates changes in the route views data. Um, so uh, you know, I, I I guess maybe I wasn't clear um, in my previous response, but uh, you know the. I think the working assumption amongst most people who study this uh, this transition from IPv4 to IPv6 is that it's going to take a, a long time, and um, we don't. It's an uncertain time period, um, and when faced with that uncertainty, we need to uh, make sure that the resources that are have already been allocated and assigned um, and aren't being used can be freed up uh, for use by other parties. And one of uh, you know our argument or in this paper is that one of the policies that's in place um, kind of hinders that transfer market. Um, so this was an, a, an attempt to assess uh, that, that policy. Let's thank Brendan again for his presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. Get some sleep. Great. Great. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of the Giganet and the rest of the IGF. Uh, a quick intervention. Hold on a second. I just didn't realize that you oh, were yeah, going to sure. close, uh, close the discussion quite so early. Are we out of time? There's an, um, Paul Wilson from, from APNEC, the uh, IP address registry for the Asia Pacific. And I'd, I'd just say that there is an awful lot of information that's been presented here that hides a lot more reality uh, behind it. And I would be, um, I'd be interested to to enter into a into an extended discussion with Brendan about the um, about the policy process, the origins of the policy process, 
the nature of the policy process and whose interests it, it operates in, um, which is absolutely critical to where we are now in these policies. In, in some senses, the presentation... It's not quite a direct question at this point, no. No, it's, a, it's an intervention. Not going to hear it at all? Okay. My concern with the presentation in this environment is that there's an awful lot of information about the um, policies, where these policies have come from, why they are um, as they are. And in some, in some sense, the presentation gives the idea that there's a sort of a, an RIR versus the operator or versus the community situation here, as though RIRs are imposing, imposing policies. Um, so the first, the first thing is that, on the, on the contrary, the RIRs uh, our role is to implement policies that come from the from the community. So the community that is subject to the policies for um, needs assessment, for instance, that is the community that makes the policy. The community itself decides and has decided for the last 20 years how IP addresses V4 and V6 are to be are to be ma managed. And um, in the case of transfers, which is something that is absolutely relevant to the exhaustion of IPv4 space. The discussions have been going on literally for years. I mean, I think the RAR communities, the ISP communities knew uh, before anyone else about the issue of V4 exhaustion, when it was going to happen, how likely, it, how, how quickly it was coming and so on and so forth. So really through that whole period prior to exhaustion, transfers have actually been under discussion continuously for a long time by the community. The communities have, in five different communities, because there are parallel uh, process going on. The communities have looked at needs assessment, they've looked at non-needs based assessment transfers and studied uh, studied and discussed this stuff um, very extensively. And I think it's, it's very important to understand that because I don't, uh, I think the tone as I mentioned which I think was pretty apparent as a sort of imposition of policies on the, on the community is actually quite, quite wrong. So it does need to be understood that the policies are voluntarily adopted in the mutual interest of the of the community, who is adopting, you might think that that's in some way self uh, self serving, but as a, as a self regulatory model, you might say in some senses it is. But that e even if it was self serving, that sort of flies in the face of the idea that something is being imposed on that community when the community is, is actually in control. As for the self serving nature, actually the. the the policies that are a benefit to the ISPs themselves tend to be a benefit to the community. So one of the, one of the critical issues around IPv4 consumption has been, over the years, the idea of conservation. That's the idea that addresses should be available for the future, that we shouldn't have people stockpiling addresses or, or acquiring addresses which aren't uh, for demonstrated use on the internet. That's, that's in the, in, that happens to be in the benefit of, of ISPs because of, uh, as ISPs grow, they want to make sure that addresses are available. It happens to be in the interest, actually, of the entire internet because it means that addresses are being deployed for actual usage on the internet. And it's in the, in the benefits also of newcomers, also, in terms of how the, how the internet can grow and the fact that newcomers can... Hello. Right. I think he's saying he, uh, he's got it, so I think he, he wants to respond and then we will move on to the next presenter so okay okay thank you so Brendan do you want to have a quick response okay yeah sure uh, thanks Paul for your intervention um, you know uh, I think we all the people who are in this space all understand that the policies emerge from the, the community um, you know, the point of doing empirical based research is to understand whether policies are actually working. So, um, you know, while I, you know, I, I appreciate all the points you made, um, I think that, <laughs> I think that uh, it's useful uh, for policymakers and you know, all the people that are in the community to have some empirical data. 
so uh, that that was really the point of the study. So um, you know, I hope I hope uh, people find it uh, useful, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, uh, Derek. Hello, everybody. I'll okay. I will be uh, very brief. First of all, I would like to thank uh, John and the entire GigaNet community for allowing uh, the Internet Society and me personally to be here and uh, present and launch our call for papers uh, on uh, a project that we have uh, started slowly working on. Uh, let me give you a very brief uh, history of the project. Uh, we've had, actually, I was here this morning and I listened uh, to Laura's presentation and to many other people talking about multi-stakeholder participation and actually I was, I had some notes before and uh, I would be most probably alleged of copyright infringement because I will use more or less the same words. So, uh, at the Internet Society, we are great supporters of inclusion and multi-participatory, uh, multi-stakeholder governance uh, structures for uh, the Internet. Um, however, we and we have been uh, talking a lot about the concept and how it has evolved over the years. So we've heard this morning that the you know the concept of multi-stakeholder participation is static, uh, and uh, that uh, the evolution of multi-stakeholder participation uh, has sort of uh, reached uh, a critical point, and it's now being evolved through institutional needs, uh, whether it's the ITU, uh, WIPO, uh, ICANN, etc. So. Uh, one of the questions that we have been asking uh, within our policy team has always been what would have happened, for example, if the Snowden revelations were to take place before uh, Wicked uh, at the ITU, and what would that mean for uh, multi-stakeholderism? And to this effect, we've decided to launch a project uh, which at this stage uh, has two concrete phases. It most probably will extend. The first one involved a questionnaire. So please, if you can give me the next slide. Um, Derek, thank you. Uh, we launched the questionnaire in the beginning of August and we left it open for a couple of months. More than 300 participants took place from 53 countries and the questions were broadly um, categorized under three main uh, thematic areas. The first one was uh, basic uh, I, uh, issues relating to uh, multi-stakeholder governance. The second one was about enhanced cooperation, which also, as you know, uh, the CSTD working group is currently soliciting views, was soliciting views, and also some forward-looking um, issues regarding the uh, challenges ahead. So uh, some graphic representation, as you can see, the majority came from, uh, of the answers came from civil society and the technical and academic community, uh, some governmental people and also some people from the private uh, sector responded to the questionnaire. Next one. Uh, the geography is also quite interesting. Uh, the African countries, uh, uh, people from Africa actually were the majority. We had a lot of responses from North America as well from Europe and a little bit less from the Asia Pacific. Yeah, the age group again, uh, 20 to 59 were the majority, which is to be understandable considering how complex things uh, are, but uh, we were also seeing some very uh, young people uh, up until 19 years old being interested in uh, internet governance and multi-stakeholder uh, structures. And I think that's the final. And the gender is, of course, <laughs> unfortunately, the majority were uh, male with some female participants as well. Uh, just, I think that's the last slide. Yeah. So uh, before I go to the key findings, what I want to say is that the questionnaire was structured in a way where it allowed both people with knowledge and some people who did not 
uh, have so much knowledge on multi-stake structures to participate. Uh, the questions in the beginning were very simple to the extent that uh, they were easing in. Uh, they followed uh, uh, a certain logic which allowed some people that participate more fully actually to skip the first set of questions. So the key findings of the first um, uh, phase was, of course, that internet governance of great importance. Actually, there were some very interesting answers. Some people said that it is as essential as water or electricity. Uh, the working definition of internet governance is a good starting point. Uh, uh, however, as you will see later, improvements on the definition are also required and should focus on greater clarity, comprehensiveness, and precision. Um, the compatibility between uh, internet governance and enhanced cooperation was another uh, quite uh, significant point that was picked up by the participants, uh, and a lot of them consider enhanced cooperation as an opportunity uh, to strengthen the relationship uh, between the various stakeholders. Some of them also expressed uh, the fear that enhanced cooperation might be used as a backdoor for more governmental control. Um, the, the full results of the first phase, there is a report uh, which uh, will be published later today at the Internet Society website. Uh, please refer to it. It will also be uh, right in the front uh, and read the report. So uh, whilst we were going through this process, we thought that we have some results and we would like also to hear uh, what is happening over those past 10 years, also in relation to uh, how the academics perceive the, uh, the term, what research has been conducted, what, uh, uh, what new research is out, is out there, and uh, the Internet Society being an institution that always wants to solicit views and be informed, uh, especially from the academic community, and me personally, having uh, uh, been in my previous life an academic, we've decided to launch uh, a second phase soliciting some academic uh, scholarly articles uh, on these five uh, topics which I will not read out loud and we thought that Giganet would be the appropriate place to do so uh, considering uh, its annual symposium every year uh, here at the IGF. Um, again this will be posted on the Internet Society website. If you can go to the next slide please. Thank you Derek. Uh, so these are the important dates that you might want to take a note of. I will be posting also this call for papers uh, at the GigaNet mailing list, and I would like, uh, would also appreciate if uh, you can forward it and push it through your own uh, academic channels. Um, there is the abstract submission. That's the first thing you need to consider uh, at this stage. Is at the end of December of 2013. Uh, we are also in the process of setting up a review panel. Uh, which will comprise of uh, various academics uh, from uh, hopefully around the world. We're trying to get to be as uh, geographical diverse as possible. And uh, we're also in the process of uh, talking to some academic journals in the hope that uh, there will be a special issue uh, on some, well, on the top um, papers that uh, uh, that will cover all these uh, thematic areas. In this exercise, mainly because we uh, at the Internet Society are also talking to various organizations and we're defending the multi-stakeholder model, so if there is academic research out there that can en enhance uh, the, the position of the model, can, if you want, pinpoint and identify challenges and issues surrounding the multi-stakeholder model and how we can address them in an efficient way and fix them, that would be really helpful uh, for us. Thank you very much and thank you very much for giving us this spot. Thanks. Thanks, Konstantinos. All right, at this point we're going to shift over to the fora um, format. So if I could ask Christopher Yu, Nir Kshetri Ojo, and Moaz uh, Chachu to please join me up front um, for the uh, first half of the forum. And could I also ask, so uh, as I announced earlier, we are trying to conduct this under some semblance of Chatham House rules, which means that as a result, I'm going to stop the recording, and I think we stop uh, all of the remote participation, or? Um, well, I'm definitely going to stop the recording. Yeah. 
Um, Recording stopped. Thank you. Um, and uh, for, the, for those of you who are um, um, on cameras, if I could ask that those please um, be taken down. This is, so this is a non-recordable session. So if you could please, if you, you've got a camera live, no camera for this session. Thank you. So, so all cameras are, are off for this session. Okay. We're doing this as best we can. This is a new new thing for us. 